are if you have spent any time in the psychological self-help or spiritual community, you have heard the term gaslighting. Today I'm going to unpack the concept of gaslighting so you can completely understand it. Where we have to start is the 1930s. In the 1930s there was a play that was created that was later adapted into a film. And the name of this particular play was Gaslight. Basically, the plot line is, is that there was a husband who, let's just say, was incredibly abusive. And what he wanted to do was to convince the woman that he was with, his wife, that she was completely insane to the point where he would then drive her to an institution. She would commit herself. Now, in this play, what he does is a lot of little manipulations to their environment. And when she would bring up the fact that there had been a change to the environment, he would make her believe that she wasn't remembering things right, or that she was delusional, or that she was eventually losing her mind. Now, one of the things he did in this particular play is that he took these old gaslights. For those of you who have never seen these, maybe many millennials never have been around a gaslight, what it is is it's this contraption that uses a gas like a propane to create light in the home. Now, they had gas lights in the home before a certain period of time, and what he did is he dimmed these gas lights in their home, and when she brought up the fact that the lights had been dimmed, he, of course, did the same form of psychological manipulation on her, saying, I, I just don't know what to do with you anymore. Nothing has happened to the lighting. So that's the reason that we now use the term gaslighting today to describe a certain form of psychological manipulation. To gaslight someone is to sow seeds of doubt in their mind that make them question their own sense of personal truth and reality. Things like memory, judgment, perception, feelings, etc. It is to try to convince someone that what they see they didn't see, what they hear they didn't hear, and what they felt they have no reason to feel. <sighs> to give you an example of gaslighting, I want you to imagine that I walk in the door and I hit you in the leg with a 2x4, and your leg breaks. Obviously, you're going to fall straight to the floor and you're going to be writhing around in pain. Now imagine that I look down at you and I say, Wow! That's just so weird! In fact, I should go get a doctor because something's really wrong with you if you're in that amount of pain you just fell down like that. Now imagine that you reasserted your own perception of reality, which is, What are you talking about? You hit me in the freaking leg with a 2 by 4 And to that, I would respond something like, Oh, sweetheart! No, you just fell down. Maybe I should go get a psychologist. In fact, I'm going to use my own money to get you a psychologist because I really care about you and it's so important for me to know and for you to know what's wrong with you. Do you feel that feeling? That disorientation? That panic attack you're starting to feel as a result of me saying that? That's the feeling of gaslighting. <laughs> Basically, at some point in this process, what would start to happen, especially if I was somebody that you really trusted, is you would start to doubt your own sense of reality and perception. You would start to think that potentially you were going insane. People who gaslight use things like denial, contradiction, misinformation, misdirection, and even true information and facts in order to destabilize, disorient, and delegitimize a person's sense of reality. When someone is gaslit, they end up in a state of extreme cognitive dissonance. Doubting one's own sense of sanity leads to a severe decrease in self-esteem as well. They learn to distrust their own mind and thus defer to the perceptions and control of the person gaslighting them. But the distress caused by gaslighting is not a minor thing. It is so detrimental that it causes a mental and emotional breakdown that can lead people to the psych ward and even to commit suicide. An interesting element to understand about gaslighting is that it so often involves the projecting or the transfer of something that is actually the gaslighters onto the person being gaslit. For example, let's say that you're dealing with somebody that mainstream psychology would title a narcissist or a sociopath. These are people who tend to be extremely self-centered, but of course they're not aware that they are or are unable to admit that they are. The gaslighting, part of that gaslighting, is going to involve them convincing the person being gaslit that they are completely narcissistic and completely self-centered. To understand more about this, watch my video titled Projection, Understanding the Psychology of Projecting. Gaslighting can be done consciously and deliberately as a means of creating interpersonal control. Now when I say consciously, I don't mean that this is an enlightened or awakened being doing this. No, what I mean is they're aware that they're doing this. 
But what if I told you that this is by far the more rare form of gaslighting? That gaslighting can in fact be unconsciously done, and that this is far more common. With unconscious gaslighting, a person is not aware of what they're doing, and therefore is not doing it deliberately, but is doing it nonetheless. This happens because people are not completely conscious, and most people are not self-aware. But this is not a reason to make it okay or less bad. This unconscious gaslighting is the kind of gaslighting that usually takes place in families. For example, let's say that a mother says a direct insult to her child. Now, obviously she can't own up to the fact that she said this insult because she knows that if she owned up to making that insult, she couldn't see herself as a good mother. Now, obviously, what she cares about more than anything is to see herself as a good mother. So, when she is confronted with the fact that she has said this insult, she's going to completely outright deny it. She's going to suppress the memory of having said it, and when she's confronted about it, say, I never said that. In fact, I'm not the kind of person who would ever say that. You must be inventing things, or you must have heard me wrong. To give you another example, I want you to imagine that there's a family where there is actually zero tolerance for emotions within this family, especially painful ones. Now, the child growing up in this family knows that something's missing. They know that a whole portion of themselves is not acceptable inside that home. And they also know that because there's no real relationship to be had emotionally, there's actually a serious lack of intimacy and closeness, therefore, in this home. But this is not what the family's going to say. The parents and potentially even other siblings are going to gaslight this child by saying things like, No, we are the closest family. We are the best family. We are so much closer than so many other families that we know. The parents are actually convinced this is the case. Why? Because they suppressed their emotions so long ago and learned that emotions should have no part in relationships and in fact destroys relationships to the degree that they don't actually perceive that they're missing anything. So they actually perceive this is a close family. So they're going to gaslight the kid. Because the parent has no idea that actually acknowledging emotions and directly coaching them is necessary to have a close relationship and an intimate relationship, they've lost touch with what intimacy actually is. They're going to be gaslighting this child because they are in a different reality than the child is in. Where two people are in two different perceptual realities, there is always the risk for gaslighting. And this is so often why, when you talk to two people involved in a situation, they both feel gaslit. When someone's sense of reality completely contradicts our own, we tend to doubt our own sanity. Especially if we have been heavily gaslit as a child and already doubt our ability to sense reality. To understand this dynamic in depth, watch my video titled The Most Dangerous Parallel Reality. Now I'm going to make you wear something that really sucks to admit to, but is also the key to setting yourself free. If you've been heavily gaslit in your childhood, then you're going to have a fragment or a portion of your own consciousness whose job it is to gaslight you, but this time from the inside. Let's consider this an internal gaslighter. This part has the job of making you doubt your own sense of perception and reality. It's going to be the one that causes you to feel like maybe you didn't see what you thought you saw. Maybe you didn't hear what you thought you heard. Maybe you shouldn't feel what you feel. It's that guy. I'm going to give you a little tip. This internal part is what is creating so much of the condition that mainstream psychologists are calling borderline personality. This part is committed to doing two seemingly different or opposing things, but both of which keep them safe. This is what I mean. This part thinks that it's going to stay safe, obviously, in our childhood. We know that we're a social species, right? It's going to keep you safe by developing closeness or alignment with whoever's gaslighting you by making sure that instead of sticking to your solid truth, you're going to let go of it and become uncertain. You're going to start to doubt and distrust yourself because that's the only way to not set this person who is the gaslighter off. It's the only way to not be isolated in your own perceptual reality. To the opposite, it is also aware in an almost contradictory way that this person who is gaslighting them is actually gaslighting them, that they're convinced of a parallel perceptual reality which isn't true. And so, in response to that painful state, knowing how horrible it is to be on the receiving end 
of somebody who has a completely fixed and potentially wrong sense of reality, it's going to keep this person safe by also committing to uncertainty, to confusion. Why? So that they are nothing like the person who hurt them. <laughs> Basically, this part wants to keep you in uncertainty and self-doubt so as to not be anything like the person who was gaslighting you at the same time as trying to give you alignment and further closeness with the person who was gaslighting you. And the result is living in a feeling of confusion and insecurity about your own perceptions and sense of reality all day long. It is critical to integrate this internal gaslighter because that is the only way that you're going to come out of this attitude you're in of complete confusion and self-doubt and into a state of more solidness of self-trust. Also, Integrating this part is critical because if you are in this attitude of doubt and lack of self-trust, you are a magnet to gaslighters. And not gaslighters who are doing it unconsciously, gaslighters who do it consciously. Your life's going to be full of gaslighting because you're going to fall prey to it all the time. Because any time somebody contradicts your reality, it's going to cause you to pop out into, oh no, I'm doubting myself. That being said, because of this, and in order to integrate this particular part of you, your internal gaslighter, I want you to watch a video. The video is titled, Parts Work. What is parts work and how to do it? There is an obvious issue when it comes to gaslighting. If you have been a victim of gaslighting in your life, you will become a truth seeker. End of story. You're going to become absolutely obsessed with truth. That's awesome, and it's going to serve you incredibly well up until the point where you start looking at truth in terms of the philosophy of truth itself. <laughs> this obsession is going to lead you to the understanding that when it comes to awareness, awakening, and self-development, questioning your own perceptions is critical. After all, you don't want to end up like the people who hurt you because they never questioned their reality, which part of you could see was totally false. You're going to come up against questions like, what is true? Is there truth? Or is the only truth that there is no truth? <laughs> Some people like to suggest that the antidote to experiencing gaslighting is just to get really solid on your personal truth and almost defiant with it, but that's, we already know that that doesn't work, right? I mean, all you have to do to understand that it doesn't work to fix your laurels to a solid truth is to talk to any scientist. I mean, any basic scientist can tell you that what you perceive with your senses is not necessarily reflective of the actual reality, you know? I mean, we're living in a virtual soup of radio waves all day long and we don't see that at all. Also, if you talk to a basic psychologist, they'll tell you that if you hold a cup of warm liquid, you're going to describe your relationship to the people around you as more close than you will if somebody holds you a glass of cold liquid to hold. So what's true? Are you close to them or are you not? I guess it depends on what type of liquid you hold. If you talk to basically anybody who's into the thought field, they're going to tell you that you perceive your reality and truth through the lens of your social conditioning. All you got to do is go to a particularly religiously homogenous area of the globe to see how really, really off that can be. If you talk to a spiritual teacher, they're going to tell you that you're perceiving the universe through your limited ego, which is not your non-physical self, which is by far the larger part of you, and so you're not even perceiving the universe at large. You're limited. All right, you get the point. I don't need to sell you on this anymore. Most of us at this point, especially if you're watching my videos, are at the point where you're like, okay, questioning my reality is pretty much critical. That's going to backfire, though, if you have experienced gaslighting. We all get that it's absolutely possible to not perceive truth and reality accurately and that the only way to really heal and awaken is to change the way we're perceiving things. But this awareness then serves as an excuse to doubt our own reality further. The fact that it is possible to not perceive truth and reality accurately does not get to serve as an excuse to gaslight yourself or make gaslighting okay. Something to understand about gaslighting is that gaslighting is non-accommodative by nature. It is done to nullify and get rid of one person's perspective in favor of another person's perspective. Basically, it's designed to invalidate one person's perspective because it serves the other person to be right. And when we are being gaslit, what we're allowing to happen is for our perspective to be completely invalidated. What will happen in this case is that we will begin to suffer from a lack of self-trust. 
So this is the first thing to understand. If you have suffered from gaslighting or are maybe even a victim of it right now, then your real issue is that you have no trust for yourself. And a person cannot live in an atmosphere of lack of self-trust and be healthy at the same time. You can consider this development of self-trust to be the first critical step when you've been suffering from gaslighting. It's only when you have developed the sense of self-trust that you can then begin to look at the concept of reality deconstruction in a healthy way. If you have worked on self-trust, I want you to remember something when it comes to truth, objective truth, or objective reality. Objective truth and objective reality is an amalgamation of all subjective perspective. That means that it must accommodate for and account for any perspective that is part of it as a larger picture. It must have an explanation as to why the perception of this particular part of it is what it is. I can promise you the explanation is not going to be this person's perspective is what it is because they're insane. The way to get out of a gaslight is to first practice profound compassion and radical acceptance for your own inner experience, and then to work on seeking the objective truth. It can also help you to heal immensely by experiencing other people having profound compassion and radical acceptance for your inner experience. And when you are ready to work on seeing objective truth, you have to see the angle you have and the angle they have as a part of the bigger picture. You have to see the why of why they see it the way they do, and the why of why you see it the way you do. I want you to realize something, though. Even when you come to a point where you're perceiving more of the objective truth, it doesn't mean that if you or any being came down and presented the objective truth to somebody, that they would automatically accept it. In fact, the truth is often quite the opposite. When somebody is completely committed to their subjective perspective, you're going to get a lot of pushback. Why? Because in order to adopt even the objective perspective, there has to be an expansion of perspective taking place. And this naturally, by definition, changes their perception. Now, if somebody's really resistant to changing their perception of reality, then it doesn't matter whether you're presenting the objective truth. They will perceive you as trying to do something to them that hurts them. Essentially, they're going to perceive whatever you're doing as a complete invalidation. Questioning your perception and sense of reality is about questioning where your perception and sense of reality is limited, not invalid. And there are drastic differences between those two things. Humanity has got to expand beyond its either-or mentality in order to grasp the larger consciousness that is available to them. They must step into a space of and consciousness. For more information about this, watch my video titled And Consciousness, The Modern Day Replacement for the Middle Way. And I might add here that this is very different than Agree to Disagree. By the way, I may do an entire video in the future on Agree to Disagree because it's potentially one of my least favorite things which humanity seems to value somehow. Agree to disagree is the commitment to one's solid truth. It is the commitment to not becoming awakened, in fact, and it's also a commitment to staying separate. I'm going to give you a powerful question that you can ask yourself. Now, I do have to warn you that this powerful question does come with a little bit of a warning. First, I'm going to give you the question, then I'm going to give you the warning. How does it serve them to be right how does it serve them to completely undermine my reality? You can ask yourself what their motive is, and maybe in certain situations, even directly ask them what their motive is. Obviously, a good gaslighter is not going to be able to tell you what their direct motive is. In fact, they're going to sit there and have to think about it for a while. Most people have to sit and think about it for a while, because most people don't really become conscious of why they're trying to change the reality so intensely. That being said, here's my warning. It can be a very powerful tool to try to see what someone's motive is for doing something. It can actually help you to see through a lot of abusive behaviors. However, yes, you can also be wrong. I've seen a lot of people who project motives onto others, who come up with a story about what their motive is, and their motive is not actually what they're telling themselves. So you have to understand that potentially what you come up with is not the actuality. It's still very powerful to see what motive it could be. Basically, don't automatically assume that their motive is bad. Motive is a big part of gaslighting. There must be a motive for gaslighting, either conscious or subconscious. This is why gaslighting is used as a manipulative control tactic. 
To give you an example of some of what I mean about a motive behind gaslighting, let's look back at this movie called Gaslight. I'm going to give you a few examples more than just this, but if we look back at this movie called Gaslight, the husband wanted to get rid of his wife in a way that put the fault on her instead of him. That was his motive. He saw that it could be accomplished by her being diagnosed as insane and being put in a psych ward. A parent could want your reality to be different because if it isn't, they will not get the appreciation and care in their later life that they want from you. A partner could want your reality to be different because they get to be seen as the victim and therefore the good guy in the relationship. A therapist could want your reality to be different because they see that your perspective is ruining your relationships. A friend could want your reality to be different because they're feeling like you do not see the truth of them. Why is someone wanting your reality to be different than it is? How does it serve them? How might it serve you? Why are you wanting someone's reality to be different than it is? How does it serve you? How does it serve them? Asking this question may just unearth some powerful needs that you can meet much more directly. Gaslighting undermines self-trust. It especially undermines your trust in your own sense of reality and sense of perception. But one thing I want you to understand is that developing self-trust is very, very different than developing a fixed reality that is unchangeable regardless of any information or contradictory perspectives that it meets with. I know that that's what hurt you so badly. I know that's what you don't want to be yourself. But I don't want you to confuse self-trust with developing a fixed sense of reality that might be wrong. Not having a solid core of self-trust and personal truth is an acutely painful state. And like I said before, it's not possible to actually be healthy when you're in that state of uncertainty, when you're in that state of self-doubt. So what's the alternative, you ask me? The alternative is to be solid, but open. Open to change, especially. Now the best analogy that I can give you for this is to think about the sky. The sky is always the sky. There is a solidness to the sky. And yet, if you've watched it for any amount of time, you've noticed that it changes quite a bit. It is open to change. It is possible to question your perceptions and sense of reality without losing that core of personal truth and of self-trust. Just as it is possible for the sky to change and yet remain the sky. Have a good week.